This video and all of its contents, including any opinions expressed by the narrator, are strictly for entertainment purposes only and is not intended in any way as a substitute for professional services and consultation from a licensed therapist, doctor, attorney, or other licensed professional service provider. Each person must make their own life decisions, and those decisions are theirs. Welcome back to Find Your Alpha, a channel that most modern women say they hate, but deep down, they truly love it. Today, we're back with another great story, and you can see it right on your screen. I ambushed my fiancé in the act, then forced the AP to take her away. Get out of here, he says. And here's the original post. He starts out and says, This recently happened to a good friend of mine, and he gave me permission to post about it. To keep things private, I'm going to use fictitious names and not reveal any stuff that could be used to identify the parties. As such, I'll be referring to my friend as Pete and his fiance as Laura. According to Pete, he and Laura officially started dating six years ago, got engaged two years ago, and had been living together for about 16 months when all this happened. Pete has a good job working for a supplier to the forest industry, while Laura works in the front office of a medical practice. Her office is located about 20 minutes away from our small town in one of the nearby larger towns. Being small, our town is a tight-knit community. It's surrounded by the great outdoors while being just a short drive from a cluster of larger towns with all the amenities one needs to live well. According to Pete, his relationship with Laura was awesome in every way, and there were no warning signs of problems. The only thing that somewhat concerned him was Laura was divorced. She told Pete that she and her husband married young and just grew apart. Now, I threw up a red flag right there. Because young couples typically don't just grow apart, young married couples. Normally, if you dig into it, you're probably going to find there was some infidelity somewhere that caused the breakup. Since all that happened more than five years before they met, Pete didn't see the need to investigate the matter and just accepted her explanation. Big mistake, Pete, because you always want to know if you're getting into a serious relationship with someone, what happened to their past serious relationships, especially a marriage? You don't just kind of skim over that and move forward. You need to know because her past behaviors are a good predictor of what she's going to do in the future. Back then, Laura was living in Portland. After her divorce, she got a job and moved back home with her parents, who live in one of the nearby towns I previously described. In addition to being divorced, another red flag that I and the rest of Pete's friends teased him about was that Laura was nearly six years older than him. Now, I said mistake number two because what are you thinking, guy? And it's not just for the physical attributes, okay? It's also due to how she probably views him. Because she's so much older than him, she's automatically going to feel at a different level. She's going to feel mentally superior to him, whether she is or isn't. Now, I must say, you'd never know it by looking at her. But nonetheless, we all took turns giving him grief about it, calling him cougar prey. In fairness to Laura, I must say we all really liked her. And so did our significant others. She was part of our tribe. Now, I'll get to the night where things imploded. Pete and I, along with two other friends, went on a fishing weekend. This is something we do several times per year. There's a tributary to the Columbia, just a short drive from our homes, and the fishing there is awesome. Now, when he's talking about the Columbia, he's talking about the Columbia River up in the Pacific Northwest. Though it's close by, we stay at a cabin right on the water and just do manly things while there. No women allowed. We just fish, do some hiking, chop wood, eat like pigs, drink a little, and smoke a few cigars. It's a great time, and we've been doing this for about nine years now. On these weekends, we all take Friday off, 
and meet up at the cabin after work on Thursday evening. We usually stay over two nights, then head back home in time for Saturday dinner and spend the rest of the weekend with our ladies. For this trip, we all arrived Thursday evening like normal and cooked up some steaks. After dinner, we were sitting around the fire pit talking and sipping on bourbon when Pete got a call from one of the guys he works with. The guy told Pete that he and his wife were out for dinner in a nearby town and they saw Laura there. Pete asked him if he said hello or talked to Laura. The co-worker said he didn't because she was with other people. Pete told him he should have as she was just out with some friends. The guy then reluctantly tells Pete that Laura was initially there with three other women and they all left. He said 10 minutes later, Laura came back in and sat down at the bar next to a guy. She hugged the guy and then started rubbing his back and then locked lips. Pete couldn't believe it and asked if she was still there. His co-worker told him no, advising they left together about 15 minutes ago. Pete thanked the guy and hung up. His work buddy then sent Pete a couple pictures, including one of Laura and the guy passionately kissing. This dude looked like a total loser. The guy who's telling this story is describing the guy in the picture that this Laura was with at the bar as looking like a total loser. Pete was obviously upset and checked her phone location and saw it was back at his house. Pete told us he had to go home and see what the blank was going on. We asked why and he explained. We all told him he couldn't drive as he drank too much. Pete said he didn't care. He was leaving. At that point, we decided that our friend Phil, who doesn't drink, would drive us all to Pete's house. We wanted to be there to support our friend. So we all piled into Phil's truck and headed in that direction. On the way, we told Pete whatever he does, he needs to remain calm and don't do something stupid. He said he'd try, but asked that we make sure he doesn't. Our other friend, who I'll call Scott, had gone through infidelity with his first wife. He suggested once we get there, we must record everything for our own protection. On the way, Pete kept saying, maybe it's all a misunderstanding. But deep down, he knew that was unlikely. Pete's place is a small but super nice cabin that he's buying on land contract from the current owner. He remodeled the entire cabin himself, with the help of his friends, of course. The cabin is located in a deeply forested area on a gravel road just outside town. There are only a few other homes on the road, so it's lightly traveled. When we turned onto the road to make the short drive back to Pete's house, we had Phil turn off the headlights and only use the running lights the rest of the way in order to be stealth. I swear it took us nearly 15 minutes to go less than a mile driving in the dark like that. When we got there, Laura's car was not visible. However, there was a black Chevy Impala parked in front of the garage. The car had Minnesota plates, which seemed odd, but then we saw the sticker on the back window and realized it was a rental. Phil pulled his truck right up behind the Impala to block the car from leaving. The house was pitch dark, with the exception of a few path lights out front. Before going in, we asked Pete if he was ready. He said yes, and we all started recording. It was intense. I can just imagine. As soon as we opened the door, Pete quietly made a beeline right to the master bedroom with the three of us following him. He opened the door, but the room was empty. He then moved quickly across the hall to the spare bedroom, opened the door, turned on the lights, and there was Laura bouncing on the guy from the bar like she was riding a bucking bronco. Oh my God. Gosh, I'll never forget the scene, though I sure wish I could. Pete screamed, what the expletive is going on here? Startled, Laura twisted around and literally dove off the guy onto the floor. 
The guy then let out a blood-curdling scream. It was so loud, Phil and Scott blasted into the room as they thought Pete had started beating the guy. That was not the case. It was just this slovenly guy laying there in excruciating pain after Laura's abrupt dismount. At this point, Laura had crawled to the corner and completely covered her face and body with a bed quilt. She curled up there and started crying loudly, saying she was sorry and could explain. Explain what? You know, I would let her explain. I'd say, okay, take the cover down. Tell us exactly what you were doing there. Explain it to us. We want to know. Pete then pulled the blanket and sheets off the bed, leaving the AP laying there in all his unglory, covering his stuff with both hands, wincing in pain and repeatedly apologizing. Pete asked the guy his name. Nervously, the guy gave only his first name, so Pete picked up his pants off the floor, pulled out his wallet, took out his driver's license, and read aloud the guy's full name and address. He then had Scott take a couple pictures of the license for him. Pete then asked the guy how he knew Laura. The guy said they used to work together. Pete then asked the guy how long he'd been effing her. The guy said it was just this one time. Pete laughed and told the guy, you're lying. The guy then said he and Laura dated nine or ten years ago when they worked together, but this was the first time they had met up since. Keep in mind, at this point we're all still recording everything, and Laura is still hiding under the quilt in the corner, ugly crying. Through it all, Pete stayed strong, and surprisingly strong. Pete eventually told the guy, it's time for you to go. The guy got up and went for his clothes, still holding his junk in pain. Pete told him, hold on, you're not getting your clothes unless you take your little lady with you. Hearing this, Laura started crying harder, pleading with Pete not to make her go. The dude then tells Pete, please man, just let me go and you'll never hear from me again. Pete told him that we parked behind him and will be glad to move as soon as he and his little lady leave the house. The AP then started coaxing Laura to go with him so he could leave. She refused and started sobbing for mercy like a mental patient. Finally, after nearly 45 minutes of this lunacy, She agreed to leave. Pete handed the guy his clothes and he slowly got dressed, clearly still in pain. Laura wasn't moving though, so Pete told the guy his little lady needs to get dressed and get out. Laura started again to insanely cry, but eventually got dressed and walked outside with her AP. Just before Phil was about to move the truck, Scott suggested that we load up the guy's car with all Laura's stuff. This way, Pete could be fully rid of her tonight. Pete agreed, and we began the task. We went to their bedroom and just started grabbing her clothes off hangers. All her shoes, bras, panties, makeup, personal products, keepsakes, jewelry, you name it. We combed the entire place until we got everything of Laura's we could find. We jammed the trunk and back seat so full that the trunk barely closed, and the back window was completely blocked by her stuff piled to the roof. Impalas are big cars with huge trunks, so you can imagine just how much we had to jam in that boat to fill it up. During the time we were putting her things in the car, Laura had stopped crying and just appeared to be in shock. She just sat there staring straight ahead without blinking, shaking like she was freezing. Whether she was faking the shakes, who knows, but the scene was dramatic nonetheless. Meanwhile, her AP sat head down behind the wheel, looking at stuff on his phone. We figured he was probably searching for the nearest walk-in clinic or emergency room to get his junk examined. After everything was packed, we moved the truck and they drove off. We all decided to stay at Pete's that night. In the morning, we loaded the soiled mattress and a few things we missed into the truck. 
Pete drove Laura's car and I rode with him as he led the way over to Laura's mom's house with Phil and Scott following in the truck. On the way, Pete called her mom to let her know we were coming over. To his surprise, Laura wasn't there. We all wondered where she spent the night. When we arrived, Pete went in to explain to her mom what happened, but didn't share any of the videos. He had a lot of respect for Laura's mom and didn't want to upset her more than she already was. According to Pete, their conversation was very emotional. He left Laura's car in the driveway and gave the keys to her mom. She opened the garage door and we moved the mattress and various miscellaneous items into the garage. On the way back to Pete's, we stopped at Ace and picked up new door locks. Now, when he's saying Ace, I'm assuming he's meaning Ace Hardware. We went to Pete's house, changed out the locks, and then all headed back to the cabin. We spent the rest of Friday and all day Saturday doing all the normal things we do out there, making sure we kept Pete in good spirits. Surprisingly, my man handled everything like a champ. While he was obviously upset, he didn't break down once and kept focusing on the bright side and his future. Laura tried reaching him all weekend, but he turned his phone off and just ignored her. In the end, he realized how lucky he was to find out what kind of woman Laura was before marrying her. He admitted to us that he was planning to ask her to marry him sometime in the near future. Wow, he really dodged a bullet there. I guess she really blew things that night in more ways than one, he says. (laughs) So that's the story, or at least where things are now. I know this whole thing sounds crazy, but I assure you this is how it all went down. In fact, Pete himself proofread everything I wrote before I posted it. We hope this might help those dealing with a cheater and give them some support and suggestions on how to handle things. Thanks for reading this. Stay strong, brothers. The end. So that's the end of his original post. Now, he does have an update. But before we get to the update, I wanted to remind you, if you're liking what you've heard so far, hit that like button. That will help get this video seen by people all over the planet. Now, let's take a look at that update. And the update, it's the final update, actually. It comes three months following the original post. He starts out and he says, I'm back with an update. But instead of me relaying things secondhand, I'm handing my laptop over to Pete himself. And he's going to let everyone know what's been happening in his life since that crazy Thursday night a few months ago. Let me say before I do, We're all proud of how Pete handled this difficult situation. He's a rock. And then it transitions here and uh, he says, hello, Pete here. So now this Pete has taken over and he's posting. Pete says, first, I wanted to thank everyone for the overwhelming response to my story. I appreciate all the support I've received. However, most of the credit goes to my good friends who were with me that night and have been right there with me in the days and weeks that followed. Without them, things would have gone differently that night and I would likely be incarcerated now. I'll start by saying Laura and I are done and there's absolutely no chance for reconciliation of any kind, not even a friendship. That's smart, guy. That is very smart. I'm completely done and would prefer to never see or hear from her again. Some might say my stance is extreme, but I would tell those people you can't really understand the situation unless you've experienced it yourself. I know myself well, and the best thing for my sanity is for me to learn from this and move forward with my life. Moving forward without Laura is not as difficult as it sounds, as the Laura I loved for nearly six years died the night she gave herself to the other guy. For me, I don't give second chances to anyone. Burn me once and we're done, and not just with women, but with everything. I'm the same way. I mean, that's my stance on things as well. 
you know, if somebody burns me, I'm done with them. I really can't trust them anymore, and I really don't want anything to do with them. Now, to answer some questions about Laura and her lover boy, I found out he's 39 years old, married with two teenage kids, and lives in the Portland area. By the way, I'm 28, and Laura is almost 34. After I ended things with her, I reached out to the guy's wife through social media. As it turned out, she was already in the process of divorcing him, but he had been begging her to reconsider. The evidence I provided sealed their fate. Now listen to this. What she then told me blew my mind. She said Laura and her husband, so Laura, this guy's fiancé, and this woman's husband, worked together 11 years ago and had an affair. I interjected and said her husband told me they dated. She said that's a lie. They never dated. They were both married. She said she discovered the affair and then told Laura's husband, who immediately divorced her. Laura's explanation about her marriage ending because they drifted apart was a lie. See what I was saying up front? The guy's wife further explained that instead of divorcing, she made her husband move out, and they lived apart for nearly five years while still making him pay for everything. Eventually, she let him move back in for the kids, which she said in hindsight was a mistake. She said she's got a great job now, her kids are grown, and she no longer needs him. She didn't come right out and say it, but from her description of things, she's been getting her needs met by others having minimal intimacy with her husband since he cheated on her. Now, a lot of you had questions about the guy himself, asking if he was rich, if he had a great body or some other special attribute that attracted Laura to him. The answer is no. The guy has an okay job, but I make at least $30,000 more than him. As far as looks, he's 5'9 tops and is out of shape and flabby. As far as looks go, he's average at best. I must also add his package was well below average. I know this because I unfortunately saw it firsthand the night I confronted them. Regardless of his shortcomings, though, the guy obviously has something Laura can't resist. Maybe it's some sort of kink fetish or something? Who knows? As for Laura, her mother tells me she's an emotional mess. She misses me terribly and is truly regretful. I did agree to have one final conversation with her, which took place a few months after D-Day. I did it for Laura's mom, as she begged me to just let her apologize. I agreed with the understanding that I would be recording the call. On the call, she said all the things you would expect. How sorry she was. She misses me so much. She regrets everything. It meant nothing. I'm the only man she ever loved. Yada, yada, yada. I listened to her, and when she finished, I asked if that was all she had to say. She said yes, then asked me how I was doing. I told her I was doing great now, which made her cry. I then politely ended the call, and that was the last contact I had with her. Looking back, I would have done some things differently, like probing more into the reason why her marriage ended. But I realize now that getting into a relationship with a woman is a high-risk game. No matter what precautions you take, it's never going to be fail-safe. You just never know how she's going to turn out. And that's a good point because a lot of guys out there think, oh, you know what, if I go out and just marry a virgin, then everything's going to be fine. You know, she's going to be loyal to me forever. But you would be surprised in a number of those situations, those women as well end up stepping out on their husbands. As for me, I'm taking a break from women now. Interestingly enough, Listen to this now. This is crazy. The AP's wife messaged me and told me she found me attractive and said if I ever wanted to get a little revenge, she would gladly oblige. No joke. 
she came right out and propositioned me like that. I politely told her thanks, but no thanks. Two wrongs don't make a right, as they say. So that's all, folks. It's over. I hope my story can help others who are working through infidelity and all the loss, pain, and humiliation that comes with it. One recommendation I have for those of you who are is to get yourself a good support system. Things would have turned out much worse for me that night had my friends not been with me. Stay strong and live well, Pete. And that's his story. And I think it was a great story with a lot of good lessons. So with that in mind, I wanted to go over what I think are the morals of this story. Number one, relationships with older women are not recommended. In fact, I strongly discourage them. Not just, like I said before, from the physical standpoint, but also from the mental standpoint. She's always going to feel superior to you because of her age difference. The next point, young married couples typically don't just drift apart. And we found that out in this story. She claimed they drifted apart, but you found out later she actually cheated. And that's the reason why they got the divorce. Number three, never confront a cheater alone. Always have witnesses. This guy admits that he would probably be in jail if it wasn't for his friends being there with him. So that's very good advice. Number four, and we said this on how many videos, once a cheater, always a cheater. And not just always a cheater, but oftentimes with that same person. Look, this woman had an affair with this guy 10 or 11 years ago. And this guy is like a slob. So it doesn't even matter what he looks like. And now here she is hooking up with him again 11 years later. Number five, never employ violence when confronting a cheater or the AP. I've said this over and over. If you do, it's very likely you're the only one that's going to get hurt in the long run. Once cheating has occurred, the relationship is over. It's finito. It's done. Don't try to make things work. Don't beat around the bush and contemplate, oh, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do this. We could go to counseling. No, you do what this guy did. You cut her off immediately and move forward and don't have anything to do with her. And then finally, the best revenge is living a great life. And this guy obviously is. He's got a lot going for him. He's got a good job. He's got a great cabin that he's buying on land contract. He's fixed it up himself. He's living in an area with a lot of friends he has. They love the great outdoors. They love fishing. This guy's got a great life. And I wish him well. He handled the situation after the cheating perfectly. Now, he made a lot of mistakes up front, but after that, I mean, the guy did very well, you know, once he found out she was cheating. So those are my thoughts, but now I want to hear from you. What did you think of this story? How do you think this guy handled it? Would you have handled it the same way? Tell us about it in the comments. Also, be sure to like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to this channel, and I will talk to you on the next one.